Hey there, you looking kind of cute. Please consider subscribing. Let's have some fun. Story brought to you by Debbie Sybil. Tabanka. A painful feeling of unrequited love, typically for a former lover and causing unbalanced or violent behavior. I never did discover just why Karen called her restaurant Tabanka, but then I have only known her for about four years since she first came to Grenada from Trinidad. She was clearing Thornbush from the steep hillside, or rather directing a crew of men in that task, when I first made her acquaintance. In the way in which one greets every passerby on the island, she looked up and said, Hello, as I passed. Hot work in this sun. What are you up to? I'm going to build a restaurant here with the best view in the whole island. She was right about that. The two-mile sweep of the great beach of the Grand Ants opened in front of us, surf breaking among the coconut palms, and then beyond we looked into the port of St. George's, the capital of Grenada, little more than a quaint village with red roofs and pink or whitewashed walls, with the yacht club off to one side, and the towering central mountains of the island forming a perfect backdrop. From the beginning, it was going to be called Tabanka, and over the next two and a half years, as she struggled to build the restaurant, with its ramp down to the beach, we gradually struck up a friendship whenever my wife and I visited the island. We saw the thorn bush gradually replaced by irrigated gardens, the trellised patio become a favorite place to sip a rum punch, and the cuisine change from just good to superb, the best food in Grenada, if not in the whole Caribbean. The innate sadness we had seen in Karen from the beginning never went away. What was this tabanka which haunted her? The hurricane season was not really over, but no tropical storm tracks threatened Grenada for this first ocean race of the season, and at the end of November, Janine and I flew down from Toronto, getting away just 12 hours before the first major snowstorm of the winter closed down the airport. Meredith had sailed his ocean-going sloop over from Virgin Gorda with one man as crew, a man who had come along just for the trip and did not intend to crew in the week-long St. George's regatta. Janine and I were to be his crew for the races. We met at the yacht club, Meredith looking lean and tanned, fit from his long sail. He looked as if he was finally recovering from the trauma of his divorce in which his ex-wife had taken his house and all he possessed away from him, except for his yacht, which was not in Canada at the time. For a time after that divorce, Meredith had gone on working and paying alimony, but a killing on the stock market enabled him to quit his job and gave him just enough to live permanently on his boat, no longer paying through the nose to keep his ex in furs. Meredith was bitter about it all, the next day, the three of us lunched at the Tabanka, giving us an opportunity to introduce Meredith to Karen. The next few days were busy ones, tuning Valella for the races. Valella is a Peterson-designed boat, named after the marine animal known as the By the Wind Sailor, and is sky blue, like its azure namesake. Janine and I were staying on True Blue Bay at that jewel of a tiny hotel, the True Blue Inn, whose owner was also intending sailing his yacht Caramba in the regatta. The first night, Meredith, who was living on Valella, moored in True Blue, but then he changed his moorings to the Grand Ants for some unfathomed reason, much less convenient for us when we were helping him tune the boat, and we complained bitterly. Meredith just smiled. My major task was scrubbing the keel and underwater parts of the hull to remove the weeds and barnacles. I donned scuba gear for this, but my hands were soon scraped raw from the barnacles. Janine and Meredith busied themselves with the rigging and sails. It was Meredith himself who looked after the catering and chandlery for the boat, not leaving it to my wife, who had volunteered. That Friday, the day before the regatta began, our chores all completed, Janine and I lunched at the Tabanka, sitting on the patio in the shade of the trellises, surrounded by bougainvillea, hibiscus, and flamboyant trees, and brilliant iridescent hummingbirds. We were the only customers there, except for three men, seated on stools at the bar. We were both wearing batik sundresses over our swimsuits, our eyes shaded by broad-brimmed straw hats. An iguana was sunning itself on the rocks below us. The sea was an intense blue offshore, 
Over at the Grenada Yacht Club, three miles across the bay, there were more boats than usual, all assembled for the regatta. And there was Valella, moored just below us. While we waited for lunch, I was drinking draft beer, almost the only place on the where it was served. And Janine had a rum punch, one of the specialties of the house, a punch Karen had named Tabanka Tears. What was this Tabanka which afflicted Karen? One armadillo poked its nose out of a crack in the rocks and sniffed the air. The Grand Dance Beach was almost deserted in the lethargy of midday, but I idly watched two girls strolling along hand in hand, the shorter one with bare shoulders clad in a perio, that South Seas wrap which had become popular amongst tourists in the Caribbean, and the taller, slimmer girl wearing just a bikini. At the base of the ramp, both girls stopped to put on thong sandals, and the tall bikini miss threw on an oversized t-shirt appliqued with the word Italia across the bust. They sat down three tables from us in the full sun and promptly ordered pints of draft ale, full-sized British 20-ounce pints, not the much smaller American pints. Janine sat facing them while I was angled slightly away. Three pints later, while we were eating lobster tails, Miss Perio walked past our table towards the washroom. I saw Janine looking surprised. Henri, is that a man in drag? <laughs> Janine has always been interested in cross-dressers. After all, she is married to one. I looked at her retreating back. Taller than I had thought at first. Beefy shoulders, pink tan from the sun, no sign of strap marks. Big hands with short pink nails, big feet, nails enameled to match the fingernails. A short haircut with curly grizzled hair, discreet golden ear clips, obviously not real gold. Could be. I watched her return. Not much makeup except for the eyes, what I could see of them through the sunglasses. No eyebrows at all. They were completely plucked away, just a penciled line. As she passed, Janine greeted her. Hello there. What a pretty perio you are wearing. I... no. English. Janine repeated it in Italian. After all, her companion was wearing a t-shirt emblazoned Italia. I tried German. Deutsch? Ja, ja. Sein pario is sehr elegant. Janine butted in. Ich bin Janine und mein Mann ist Debbie genannt. Very chic. Very stylish. I'm Janine and my husband is called Debbie. She swished her perio around her calves. Ich bin Helga und meine Freunde ist Christa genannt. A baritone voice. I saw the Adam's apple. Helga returned to her table and her friend Krista and ordered yet another pint of beer. Helga must be five foot nine, don't you think, Jamie? Taller than she seemed when she first came up from the beach. That makes Krista over six feet. They're definitely both men. I shifted my chair so that I could get a better sight of them, hoping my sunglasses would stop them from noticing that I was staring. Krista, too, had an Adam's apple, but unlike her friend, she had kept her own eyebrows, just plucking the line slightly. Her long, blondish hair was piled up on top of her head, secured with a large pink plastic clip. Coral pink lipstick did not match the hair clip, and her orange-pink nail varnish on long nails clashed with both pinks. She did not know how to cope with her long nails and held her hands awkwardly. I finished my lobster and Janine was still eating when two Nordic-looking men strolled up from the beach in t-shirts and shorts with thong sandals on their feet. They joined Helga and Krista, each of them kissing both girls on the mouth, and immediately ordered a round of beer and pulled off their t-shirts. The iguana had disappeared after all this activity, and just then Meredith joined us and ordered a beer too. He looked open-mouthed as one of the newcomers stepped behind Helga, reached over her shoulders, and pulled at the knot of the perio, letting it fall around her waist. Helga's flat male torso was evenly tanned all over. She rose to her feet, clad only in a bikini bottom, and handed the perio to her tormentor, who promptly tied it around himself. Helga donned a pair of shorts from her tote bag and sat down again to wipe off her makeup and remove her earrings— then shrugged into one of those embroidered men's shirts, locally known as a bush jacket. Her tormentor freed his ponytail, combed his hair and clipped it back on each side with a comb, then started to apply makeup. Helga handed him her earrings and began to remove the nail polish. Meredith's beer was untouched. 
Then the other newcomer stepped behind Krista and unclipped her hair. She turned and slapped him, grabbed the clip and put her hair up again. She was going to stay femme. He shrugged, dropped his shorts to reveal a flowered bikini bottom, pulled a matching top out of his bag and put that on, then inserted foam pads. Meredith choked over his beer while Janine's lobster was cooling rapidly. Bikini Man turned his back to Krista and gestured. She started plating his hair for him, coiled it around his head and pinned it on top. He added a pair of hoop earrings, rather like the ones Krista herself was wearing, and then started to apply makeup. Krista did his eyes for him and then applied artificial nails like hers. Meredith finished his beer, Janine her lobster, and Meredith ordered a bowl of Callaloo soup. The other table had another round of beer and then left without eating anything. Karen brought over the Callaloo. What do you think of my floor show? Does it happen often? Almost every day for the last week. I've no objection to cross-dressing, as you know, but I do wish they wouldn't change around in public like that. Some of my regulars are protesting and threatening not to come here. Are they all four men, Karen? Is the slim one a man, too? Krista, you mean? Yes, she's a man, though I've only once seen her dressed as a man. She's the only one of them who dresses chiefly as a woman. The other three change around, as you saw today. Sit down and have a drink with us, at least until other customers arrive. Thank you. I do hope those four are only here for a few days. I hate to think what will happen to my trade if they are still here when the tourist season really begins. She looked worried. Meredith reached out and touched her hand to offer comfort. At least they only come during the day. You don't have them during your busiest time in the evening. That night was the Commodore's Ball. Black tie for the men despite the heat and long dresses for the women. Janine wore a décolleté deep blue silk dress, heavily embroidered with gold thread on the bodice, and had her hair up, complaining about its condition after the sun and wind of Theris, and about the state of her hands after hauling on ropes all day. Meredith wore a white tuxedo, as I had thought of doing, but Janine had persuaded me to dress, so I wore a turquoise floor-length dress with strappy sandals and a longer evening wig. Tony Porter, our host, it had reserved a table for the cruise and drove Jillian, his wife, and the two of us to the clubhouse. Tim and Penny, his crew together with Meredith, were to meet us there. Meredith's partner was a surprise to us all. Karen had forsaken her restaurant on the busiest night of the week, leaving it in the hands of her staff, and was here dressed in an elegant asymmetrical black silk gown with one bare shoulder. We dined on rubber chicken, not a patch on the wonderful food at the Tabanka or at the True Blue Inn, the only other Grenadian restaurant in the same class as the Tabanka, to the music of a local band. At least it was not a steel band, so that we could actually hear each other talking. Then the band trooped off, and another combo came in to play for the dancing, a four-piece combo of guitar, saxophone, keyboard, and drums. The musicians all in electric blue sequined mini dresses, were our transvestite friends from the day before. Helga played the alto sax. Krista, with much shorter nails than she had worn at the restaurant, was at the keyboard and also provided the vocals in a light tenor. They were good. There was no doubt about that, and a pleasure to dance to. Karen was clearly not going to get her wish. They would be here all through the tourist season with gigs at all the main hotels and restaurants along the tourist strip. But Karen no longer really cared. Karen was going to build a jetty at Tabanka to accommodate the seaborne restaurant trade, she said. Perhaps Karen's long Tabanka was finally a thing of the past. Meredith's certainly was. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out Patreon for early access and exclusive content. <laughs>